Uh, Francis, you didn't say what the goal of your journey was, whether it was a personal goal that you set for yourself or whether it was on behalf of an organization. And I also wondered what your means of transportation was. Okay, good question. So the goal of my journey was just to visit all 54 African countries. It's part of a larger goal. I want to visit all 92, 192 countries, actually 993 now with South Sudan, uh, countries in the world. And it's a personal goal. I didn't have an organization behind me. I just had saved up some money, economized. And, and one way that I traveled relatively cheaply in Africa, I mean, it starts up with an upfront expense. You have to buy a car, a truck, a 4x4. There's no way you're going to make it without a 4x4. The roads are very atrocious in many sections. Um, and you have to go through sand and, and mud, and it's incredible. And I did a lot of camping to keep the cost down. And so I bought one car in Spain. I drove it across the Strait of Gibraltar. And I drove it until around Benin. And maybe the voodoo kind of destroyed it. Because in the end, in Benin, I bought a new car, a Toyota Hilux, which is like a Toyota Tacoma, which is much more reliable. And that got me the rest of the countries. The only exception to that was the seven island nations in Africa. There, I would park the car on the mainland, take a uh, flight usually to go to, let's say, Cape Verde or to Madagascar and these island nations. And then I would come back and pick up the car and keep going. So it was just too expensive to take the car, and it's kind of useless. So that was it. There was another question yes. over there. And you know, Francis uh, has hiked all around the United States as well. And in reading the uh, first chapter of his book, which is called Hike Your Own Hike, uh, he passed through Salisbury on the Appalachian Trail in August of 2001. So if he looks familiar, you might have, <laughs> you might have seen him. Before. I think I had more hair. <laughs> <laughs> this question is about rejoice. Yes, stand up. I'm curious to know how a young girl growing up in your culture knew of, of how to escape. Give her the mic, maybe? Yeah. Uh, so, so what was the question again? <laughs> how a young girl knew how to escape. Okay. Hold it close to your mouth, Rejoice. So I, where I grow up, She's a little shy sometimes. Go ahead. At, at seven, at seven years old, I was already um, big enough to to be cooking, cleaning, and doing everything for myself. So at the age of eleven, I was already a woman who is ready to be married, and so I just know how to do everything. You have to think for yourself and find a way to survive or you have to just let your parents and the community uh, choose a life for you. So I decided to think for myself and I found a way to do things that made me who I am today. I, if I didn't think for myself, I let my mom and the community choose for me. I would be miserable today. I had many other friends, girls, who uh, today maybe have seven children, I don't know, maybe five. And I am sure if I am to talk with them today, it's not what they want, they wanted something different. So I just have, it's a survival of the fetus. You have to think for yourself and choose to do things, or else you would allow the community to to choose for you. And it's always not good what they choose for you. I was going to get married to a man, maybe he's 50, or maybe he's 55. And I was just 11, 12, 13, at the age of 13, before my my first menstrual cycle, I would be get, I would be married, whether I want it or not. I would get married. And I didn't want that, so I ran away. Mm -hmm. And I was constantly in a war with my mom because she wanted me to get married. She would get money, she would get gifts from all the, from the man who is going to marry me. 
She has nothing to lose, but I have everything to lose. Can you, sorry, can you rejoice? I know how media had an impact. One thing that's interesting, when you go to the deep into Africa, sometimes, let's say in the Sahara especially, they might have satellite dishes. And it's amazing, the, you know, we look at television as a negative thing that we want to avoid and turn off the TV and all this other stuff. But it has a real cultural impact in Africa and in societies that are extremely conservative. So can you talk, Rejoice, briefly about what impact the satellite, you know, the, it wasn't satellite television, it was VHS she was watching. And yeah, so for the village I was living, from time to time we get uh, the chance to watch movies. We don't have electricity, so my mom has a generator and we have this big black and white TV and uh, the cassette, the place to put the cassette. And there's only a few people in the village who have it and my mom happened to be one of them. So from time to time we will watch American movies and one of the, my favorite movie that I remember was the Rambo. The Ram <laughs> Rambo. <laughs> yeah. Rambo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Rambo movie, so I watched it many times because it's one of the only cassettes that we have plus some other Indian movies and so I would watch this movie and I see that uh, there is another place that is not like my village yeah. and I wanted to be in that place. We also watched some other movies with the uh, beach and the women having some nice drinks at the beach, you know, the color they have. Beach <laughs> they have, like a bingo and Rambo come they together. Have, yeah, they Great have, uh, opportunity. Yeah, they have this drink. When you look at it, it has a, a little umbrella in the glass <laughs> and the juice, uh, the drink has many layers of colors. And I watch the movie and I, I tell myself, I want to have this drink and I, to, <laughs> and I also want to, to be at the beach. The sun is white and where we were the sun is, is not white, it is all dirty so I want to be to the beach and I also want to wear the bikini. I didn't knew that is what it's called but the women are having no clothes on them, only the small clothes and in my village all the women are covered and it is it is, uh, it is not like the woman in the TV. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, and, and the men also in the TV, they were very nice. They bring the glass of juice to the woman and they, they do things differently than what I see in my, in my place. And so I wanted to be, to go to that place in the TV. And so I begin to come up with plans on how to get there. <laughs> and one of the things is not to get married because I know when I will get married, I will have a baby, babies, and then I cannot be able to go again to the beach to have my drinks <laughs> and, uh, and also to see Rambo. So I, I didn't accept my mom's wishes on me. That's great. Thank you. Other questions? Oh, uh, what, what brings you back to Salisbury this time? And how long will you be here? <laughs> okay. um, what, what brings me back? I, okay. I keep that. Um, what brings me back to Salisbury? Um, basically, uh, Lloyd over here. Yes, Lloyd thank Baruti. You, Lloyd Baruti. For yes, Lloyd Baruti. Uh, yes. Uh, and he's and a Christ local. He, he grew up here. And uh, we, he was the last. American that I saw as I was leaving to Africa. So I left in February 2013. And I never came back to the United States until la about last week. So I never left the continent for five years. I was there nonstop, roughly five weeks per country. 54 countries, that makes it about a five-year journey. And Lloyd was, uh, I had recently just met him, and, and he was the, like the last person. And now it just turns out he's the first person who welcomes me back. Um, and so it's great. I actually have horrible memories of Connecticut because I had gone through the Appalachian Trail. I started in Maine, actually. I did the reverse way. I started in Maine and was walking through. And I went through, and I remember being through Kent. And I remember it was a heat wave. I had to borrow, at midnight, I got up and poured water on my head from a hose that I found. 
just to cool off. It was one of these summer heat waves. So I was like, Connecticut is, but now it's much better. <laughs> yeah, thank you. For all of you, um, all of our Harvard alumni, <coughs> the connection between Lloyd and Francis is that they were both um, Harvard Business School graduates. That's and true. So that's how they connected. So those of you with that Harvard connection can uh, talk to them about that at coffee hour. Bruce? So what's your assessment of Africa? I, my conception is it's very fractionated and never going to be able to pull itself together. Are you hopeful or after, after this time, uh, and you've been there a couple of times, what's your, what's your view of the dark garden? Dark garden. Yeah, that's right. Um, as one person said, the only thing dark about Africa is our ignorance of it. There is a lot of, uh, but, but a lot of what you say, Bruce, is right. Um, it is a fractured continent in many ways. Uh, it, it does definitely have some tribal elements. Uh, of course, you know, Europe has tribal elements. America has tribal elements. And so there is some, you know, this, this tug and pull between unity, just like the EU, European Union wants to pull together, part of it wants to pull apart. There's this struggle. Um, same thing happens with Africa. However, I would say that the general trend for Africa as a continent is positive, and it is moving forward. There is now regional training, trading blocks, for example, that have been developing for the last couple of decades, and now even the African Union, the AU, which is trying to model itself after the EU in some extent, they're getting more and more uh, together. They're creating an African passport, which will allow passport-free travel for Africans. They're uh, working on the Afro, which is a Euro currency. It's like the EU, for, sorry, the Euro. Um, so there's steps, baby steps, toward improving the continent. But it's definitely a long road ahead. My, if you want me to summarize it in one sentence, it's this. Africa will continue to get better, and it will continue to lag behind the rest of the other continents for at least the next 100 years. I know that I, I can't even imagine how many languages uh, were spread over all those countries. I mean, even in tiny little Malawi, there are two or three. Yeah. Uh, in some places, there's some prevalence of English, but certainly not always. How did you communicate? How did you meet people as you went to new places? And did you have others to help you to speak to those who didn't speak English? Yes, I was very fortunate. My mom is from Chile, from Santiago, Chile. So in my family, we spoke Spanish at home. My father was French, and they met in San Francisco. So they sent me to a, a French American, you have Hotchkiss here. I went to a French American International School. It was a bilingual school from the age of kindergarten all the way to 15 years old. So math, physics, history, all was taught in French. So my French, got in, I got it in school at Spanish. We spoke, uh, I got it from the house. From my mom and dad, both spoke to me in Spanish. And uh, of course, I speak a little bit of English. And so those three languages really help a lot in Africa because about half the continent is Francophone, almost half. And then about maybe a, a quarter or 20% is uh, Anglophone. And then I, because I speak French and Spanish, I can get by quite easily with Portuguese. I can get by. And that's about five of the 54 countries are Portuguese colony, ex-Portuguese colonies. And so actually, I had spent prior to this three years in Eastern Europe. And even though Eastern Europe is more rich, developed, et cetera, I found it more difficult to get by in many ways in Eastern Europe because I didn't have any of the Slavic languages under my belt. And so I struggled. In Africa, I usually could, I usually could find people. But you're right, you know, not everybody speaks the, in these big international languages. Uh, certain countries, they don't. Uh, my wife, Rejoice, she speaks five languages, English, French, and three African languages, uh, Hausa, Kanuri, and Fulfude. And those three languages are big. You know, there's like 20 million speakers of some of those languages. Um, but you don't hear about them because they're only regional. So that was, and, and here's the last thing I'll say about communication. Communication is, in the end, about desire to help and to communicate. You need that. To begin with, for example, in Eastern Europe, even if I could speak with an English speaker in Eastern Europe, sometimes they were so cold and frigid and, and difficult 
from you know their, their their culture is much more versus the African culture in general is much more warm. So you don't you just do hand signals and stuff like that. They will do everything they can to try to understand you. Yes, yes, okay, okay, yeah, and then we'll, and we'll do what you can. So the African spirit really helps even when you cannot have a common language barrier. They will bend over backwards to try to help you out and try to understand what you're saying, and they're patient, very patient. Mm. Sal? Yeah. With all this travel throughout Africa, did you ever get seriously ill? Yes, I got uh, six times. I got malaria. Uh, one time, actually, uh, rejoice. Uh, do you want to briefly summarize my... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, she can say. She okay. Says, she's feeling, she's feeling. Come on, stand up. Uh, so Rejoice actually literally saved my life when I was on Death Mountain in Nigeria. Nigeria, the tallest mountain of Nigeria is called Death Mountain, which was appropriate because I had malaria on it and I was feeling really bad. It was really on the way down where I was going down. My fever was at 41 degrees Celsius, which the doctor said, I've had patients die at that temperature. And so they were, you can briefly s summarize how you were watching me die. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so he has the worst malaria you can get. I didn't, I never had that, that malaria he has. And we were climbing the, the dead mountain, it's uh, the tallest mountain of Nigeria. He was n not feeling very well when we started, but in the middle, he got worse. He was very hot when you touch his body, and uh, we have no medication. We have, and we are on the mountain. It's not like a flat terrain. We have to either go back or go up. And we had a guide, a local man from the village where we left our car. And so we found a little hut during the hike and left Francis, I know how important it is for him to go to the summit of the mountains. And we were halfway, if we had to go back, then we have to come back and restart it again. So I calculated, he was, he can't decide for himself at that yeah. moment because he was confused and he wasn't thinking right. So I had to think. So but, sorry to interrupt. Can you talk, talk about when the, the, the guy was, the Muslim who was trying to save me at the hospital? Yeah, well, we, I went to the summit and did what he usually do, and then we brought him back. And uh, the doctor, he, when we arrived at the village, he's like, oh, no, 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 I can't do this, because if this man dies here, my license for practicing the doctor medicine is going to be taken away from me. He's American. How can you do this to me? How can you bring this man to me? He was so afraid and shaking and running all over to find something. And... Uh, he, we put him in the hospital, he was like dying, he can't, you call him, he doesn't answer, he was unconscious, and the doctor was so, like, he was confused, and, but in the end, he managed to save him, whenever, he comes back every 10 minutes to, to ask me, how is he, you should uh, put water on his body, and please, when he start, when he wake up, you should take him to a better hospital. <laughs> Well, we're glad you made it. Yeah. Thank you for being yeah. so resourceful yeah. again. But I'll say one more thing about malaria, which is, again, is un, un, people don't think about. Africans in general see malaria as the flu, as we see the flu, right? What does the flu do? It kills old people and children and people who are weak. But in general, most of us go through the flu, and some of us get our flu shots, some of us don't. We really don't care. If you get the flu, it sucks, but you'll get through it, right? Um, that's how Africans look at malaria. They don't see it as this really deadly. And, and nowadays, malaria kills far fewer than it used to. And uh, with medication, is super cheap. It, co it might cost. Here's a, one other thing. I, I, I would find out that a lot of them would blame all their maladies on malaria. They'd say, you know, I'm, I'm sick. I must have malaria. My, my elbow hurts. It must be malaria. Everything was malaria like for them. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It could be. And so, um, and w the thing is, is that to test yourself for malaria, it might cost $5 to test to see whether you have it, but the medication costs $2. So guess what they do? They just take the medication and just like, okay, well, we'll see if I feel better. You have a question. So in the end, it's not as big of a deal as, as we might think of it. They don't handle it. Go ahead. Two things. Uh, one thing about malaria is that the sickle cell trait yes. protects people from malaria. That's right. And so they're not going to get as sick as you would. 
Right, they might not get it at all, that's right. And, and, that's and there's a high percentage of blacks who have sickle cell anemia. Absolutely. That's important. Yeah. That's right. um, the perception I have of Africa, you know, we hear things in the news that people are getting massacred with machetes yeah. and, and you hear different things about the different cultures, the genital um, mutilations. Yeah. Um, and so a guy like me who may just read the paper and hear these news reports is afraid to go to Africa. Yeah. Um, and, and the world, to me, because of maybe my ignorance, is getting smaller because of the, the way the news media talks about different countries. My preference is, yeah, I'll stay here. Right. And, and so I'm losing out. Um, how do you overcome that fear. I mean, there's so many countries where I can't imagine that you went to yeah. because, you know, whether it's Mali, I believe is the name of it. Right. Yeah, I just, right. You just hear so many devastating events. Right. So that's a really good question. The best analogy I can do to kind of make you feel better is I try to imagine, let's say you're sitting in Africa and this guy is reading the newspaper about you know, Colorado, it's like, God, Colorado, mass shooting, mass shooting, another mass shooting. I'm never going to go to Colorado. But of course, have you been to Colorado? Yeah, yeah and it's fine, right? So, and the same thing, uh, so that's what's happening to us here. We look at Africa, we hear all their bad news because it's, the newscasters are going to say, hey, one million people <laughs> in South Sudan, nothing happened to them, whatever. It's not interesting. And so this is, uh, it's a perception problem. And so, just like what I remind Africans a lot of times when they even tell me, like I was going traveling through Somalia from one end to the other, and they, they said Somalia is very dangerous. I said, do you know how many, my brother lives in Chicago, 761 murders in 2016. Just in <coughs> Chicago, the city, <laughs> 700, and they're like, we don't have that many in the whole country, not that many murders in many countries. So, um, and yet, a Somali won't think twice about going to Chicago because he thinks of all the wonderful buildings and that kind of stuff, unless, of course, he read that statistic. And so that's the disconnect that th to help you get over your natural and rational phobia that you have because you read the papers and this is what it is. The only way to do it is through education and, and, and reading some more and thinking about it. There's plenty of countries, even the worst countries. I went through Mali. I went to the tallest mountain of Mali. Uh, there was, there, I went into the red zone of Mali. There was a time that I was there in 2013. Um, and it, you know, I, I survived. Now, of course, I have no idea if I, there was somebody tailing me or I just barely missed a kidnapping. I have no idea. But that same, the same could be said for me in Chicago. You know, maybe I just barely missed somebody in Chicago. Or I, so anyway, all I'm saying, the takeaway, and if there's one takeaway from this whole presentation is, is to encourage you to get out of your comfort zone, to travel. This can, this can help you grow spiritually. It can help you grow mentally, intellectually, in so many different ways. And just pick the country that is the most of a stretch that for you. For some people, that might be Kenya or Tanzania. For others, it might be uh, South Sudan. You know, but whatever it may be, but pick a country and go there Ideally, one where you don't speak the language, it will force you to get out of your comfort zone and it will have a positive and transformative impact on you, your life. And when you're on your deathbed, you'll probably be thinking back at those, that two weeks that you had in Africa and that will be one of your most memorable moments. Rob? We've been to Malawi, Uganda, Rwanda, Botswana, okay. Kenya, Tanzania, and I would, Ethiopia. I would, Ethiopia, I would concur with your view. The people are incredibly generous and kind. I guess my biggest concern about Africa is government uh, corruption. It's a huge problem, it seems to me, based on all the trips we've taken. And how do you think that's going to improve? Yeah, um, I don't think it's going to improve very fast, the government corruption. Now, you know, you look at movies like The Gangs of New York and you see that there was, you know, corruption in American society and there still is. In fact, I remember uh, reading statistics that if you see whether a society tips a lot, there's a strong correlation between the tipping culture and the corrupt level of corruption. And the bakshish culture that exists in much of North Africa, this tipping culture, 
America is some of the biggest tipping culture. And so the kind of, uh, some people will say that there's a correlation between corruption. But obviously, it's much worse in Africa. And what's terrible about Africa, as far as corruption, is that it goes through all levels of society. It goes, you will go to the street vendor and you'll buy tomatoes, and that person will miscalculate, purposely tell you you've got one kilogram when you only have 800 grams or they will charge you a little bit more, like they have a certain price, et cetera. So the corruption goes to every single level of society, and they just don't trust each other on so many different levels. And that's hard for society to move forward when I am, don't trust. If I give you $100 and you will bring, come back here tomorrow and bring me what you said you are going to bring me, and then you don't, I'm not going to give you that $100. And so then you paralyze the economy because I don't give you something to make you get going. But there is, it is one of the biggest problems that Africa has, and I don't know exactly how to fix it. So I'm writing a book about this, and about the whole trip of, through all 54 African countries, which should come out in 2020. But that's one of the things I want to try to research and grapple with. If any of you have ideas during the coffee session afterwards, tell me. I'm open to ideas. I would love to know what's the magic bullet or bullets <laughs> to uh, reduce corruption in Africa because it is, like you say, and your experience in all those countries, it is true. It's a problem. I think we could feel pretty good about that if somebody has an idea how to end corruption. <laughs> <laughs> there is those commandment things. <laughs> I wanted to share something that's very small but very humbling. Um, I went to Malawi twice and the first time was to see community-based orphan care, which uh, just so happens there are a lot of Presbyterians in Malawi because of Livingston way back then, even Scottish Presbyterians. So we were going around different places. We had nothing to give to anyone. I mean, we brought soccer balls to the children, or maybe we brought tablets or little books or whatever. But we happened to go to this little village because there was this lovely boy who had cerebral palsy, which my brother had. And he actually had a bed, and we went to visit him, and he could speak English. And he, he was, had, we brought him a radio or something, and this was just, there were eight of us, I think, going. But I came back sort of earlier to the van, and there was this huge bag of peanuts. Now, SEMA is not a healthy thing to eat. It's pretty much all they have, which doesn't have a lot of nutrition, and maybe the villagers, like we were seeing, might have chicken two or three times in a year. And so here you have all this protein in this, in this van. And the woman who was driving us around that day, who happened to be Scottish and all, um, I said, we can't accept that. I said, this, this could give this, if villages all the way around, it could give protein that they will never get otherwise. And I said, why is this here? And she said, they appreciate your coming. I said, we're not doing anything here. I mean, some places we're going to visit children. We just went to visit, visit him. And she said, they really appreciate us. I said, but it, it just doesn't seem right. And she said, Cheryl, you don't understand. Here, no one is too poor to give to others. And I will tell you, for all the things that are wrong in a country and a government and whatever, I have never been so humbled as being in Malawi and being one-on-one. Mm. -on -one. And I just happened to be a place we were more. But um, you always come back feeling touched spiritually with the beauty and generosity of people, which I think you were talking about, above and beyond all these things. Mm. Thank you for that, Cheryl. Uh I will tell uh, one short anecdote to kind of compliment that. I remember sometimes I, I almost, I, I rarely gave to these beggars because for all the reasons you can imagine. But um, sometimes I would, there was a, a child maybe about this big and I gave her like, I don't know, a banana. And then she, um, she had three other child beggars around her. Immediately she got the banana, she immediately turned around to her fellows, broke the, the thing in pieces and gave it to her fellow beggars. This culture of sharing is deep, deep in their DNA and their cultural DNA. I don't know if this is a wild question or not. <clears throat> Have you ever tried to get blood within the United States and sit through those 54 questions that the Red Cross <laughs> asked you to take? Um, and a lot of those questions relate to where you have traveled and right. how long you stayed there. <laughs> Yes, yes um, I, gave, I gave my last bit of donation. I would donate regularly blood prior to my trip to Africa. I donated blood in Africa. And it was always very funny when I donated blood in Africa because they would say, like, who are you donating blood to? I'm like, nobody, just the general community. It's like, oh, usually everybody who comes in here, they donate. Because the families are so extended, they get demands. Like, you need to donate to your cousin. 
you need to donate to your uncle. <laughs> and so they, they come in for specific reasons. Um, but I was just, since I didn't have a family in Africa, I would just donate regularly. But since I came back just about 10 days ago to the United States, I haven't given back. I'm not going to even bother to try because I already know what they're going to say. You've had malaria six times. You're banned for life. So I think uh, the only place I'm going to be able to donate blood, which is a pity because I enjoy doing it, is in poorer countries. He has another question. I've donated blood to the Red Cross 20 times or thereabouts. And uh, you get the impression going through those uh, 54 questions or whatever it is, <laughs> that if you've just gotten out of the plane and gotten on the tarmac in a lot of African countries, that's enough. The Red Cross won't take the blood. That's right. It's a deal breaker just stepping into the African continent. Are there other questions? Okay, well, we will thank you, thank both you. of you, for sharing your stories with us. Oh, and we'll up, uh, dismiss stand the up. coffee hour. Stand Barbara up. and Lee stand have uh, put together coffee hour for us this morning. And you can ask maybe your more informal questions um, of Francis and Rejoice. And I, again, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you.